Welcome to the SUNY Accessibility Week Online STEM Lab Accessibility Webinar. My name is Dr. Nicole Simon. I'm a STEM faculty member at um, Nassau Community College on Long Island. I predominantly teach physics courses. I'm also an instructional designer on my campus and an assessment fellow. So keeping that in mind, when you're building out any type of online lab, whether for accessibility or for just different pedagogical reasons, you want to keep a lot of things in mind as far as your disciplines, as far as accessibility, as far as affordability, and more importantly, as far as your learning outcomes. And I think it kind of puts together everything that I do professionally, both teaching, doing design work, and looking at assessment. So we take a look at what a science lab is. It allows students to manipulate variables and receive dynamic feedback, facilitating exploration and inquiry. We always want to keep that in mind when we're looking at science labs, whether it's hands-on, whether it's remote, whether it's a data set or virtual simulation lab or a lab kit. I'm going to go over all of those different options today. Students can investigate how things work on their own and it helps them to develop questions and answers. Properly designed labs should investigate how to how a definite purpose that is communicated clearly to students, a focus on the process of science as a way to convey content and incorporate ongoing student reflections and discussions, enable students to develop safe and conscientious lab habits and procedures. And this is as per the NCR, which is National Resource Council. So we take a look at how we teach STEM online. We have several different options. You can look at face-to-face, where we're dealing with remote labs. You're actually facing the students using different type of web technologies such as Zoom or Skype or WebEx. We can take a look at lab kits. Lab kits are another option where students are actually receiving the material at home. And when they receive the material at home from the companies, it can either be custom design or it can be a standard option. And then again, they can either do it asynchronously on their own or synchronously using web technologies. You can do virtual or simulation. At the college level, all students should have the opportunity to experience inquiry-based lab. This is vital. You want to make sure that your investigations are introduced properly. All the introductory courses are an integral part of the scientific curriculum, and your experiences help students to work independently. You want them to also be able to work collaboratively. So keeping that in mind when we start to look at the STEM courses and the STEM labs online, incorporating and critiquing public work of others through communication. So we wanna always make sure that we're dealing with research techniques, using scientific reasoning and appropriate techniques to define and solve the problem, to draw and evaluate conclusions, and make sure this is based on both qualitative and quantitative evidence. So they should work closely with your lectures in conjunction with scaffolding properly, where you're looking at the topic you're doing a work problem to understand the topic, you are practicing out that material, and then you're ultimately doing a lab to conclude that topic. Making sure they're not separate activities so that they can be standalone, but at the same token, they're not just out there and either not connecting to any part of your curricula. And making sure you have rigorous inquiry-based labs. And most teachers tend to make sure their lab techniques are based on their own coursework, whether it's in their coursework from prior experience or their coursework that you're actually dealing with in the curriculum. So synchronous versus asynchronous. If we're dealing with something that's synchronous, meaning in real time with one another, we have live classrooms, we have virtual classrooms, you have video conferencing, you have webinars, and you have distance mentoring. So all of these can be easily incorporated into a lab. Asynchronous would be your e-learning, doing different job aids, recording audio and video, and having self-study material. So we have synchronous, we need to be very mindful of certain platforms. Asynchronous, you are mindful of those platforms, but it's a little bit easier to kind of retrofit a lot of your material. And by retrofitting, I mean going back and captioning, adding more accessible material, whether it's PDF, or linking things out for students to be able to watch a video at a later date to go back and understand material, to be able to replicate it. When it's synchronous, it's a little bit trickier because you do need to be mindful from the onset, again, for those closed captionings and making sure that students have accessible material. And when we talk about accessibility, accessibility is not just about what they can have their hands on and what's workable for students of different ability levels. We wanna make sure that accessible as far as affordability. 
And again, when we have our face-to-face -face classrooms, we typically do your physical classroom, field trips, a lab. If we're dealing with a live online course, it's a virtual classroom or a webinar. Coaching could be one-on-one -on -one mentoring. When I teach my online courses, part of my office hours are online for that reason, where students can get back into the course, get back into the lab, and be able to do a one-on-one -on -one tutorial. And I think that's very important because you don't necessarily have an office where you can go back to campus and do a lab and replicate it at any given time. So being able to have an online lab, you can always hit the pause or restart button that helps students work. And that's part of the scientific method, being able to have a student experience where they're able to replicate the material and go through that scientific process, where they're dealing with inquiry, where they're dealing with testability, and they're dealing with some of the issues that come up in a typical lab setting, where you want them to be able to explore and learn and read it. <laughs> Moving towards more of the asynchronous or the on-demand portion, it's collaboration community community where you have a portal site where you have blogs where students can start to add material or chat sessions or threaded discussion things like that are important sometimes we typically think of our conclusions for a lab portion where students are writing out the conclusion and summarizing i've turned to adding more voice thread where students can actually explain what's going on in their material in their lab in their data set and just leave a quick little voice thread analysis and that seems to work just as well because students are able to communicate a little bit easier and then they can certainly summarize with the remainder of their work. Adding multimedia where it's video streaming or podcasts or distance learning. And then web-based learning, making sure that you have those simulations and gamification of education. So how do we get our students and our labs together? We have our labs and how do we get them to their home setting? And that seems to be the crux of some of the problems that we have in today's society. We don't have as many options as we think. While we do have a tremendous amount of options, it's almost too much, but it's not getting the material that we need in the proper outset. And the reason why is we always need to make sure our goals and outcomes are accounted for. I'm a big proponent when it comes to goals and outcomes. Part of the reason is I am an assessment fellow for my campus, so I'm always thinking assessment-minded, making sure the content and the focus is all about the science goals and outcomes for the course, not about the technology. And I think a lot of people tend to look at things in reverse or they're looking at the technology driving them. It's not about the technology. It's about making sure that your goals and outcomes are done properly. So that mindset, I use several different platforms for my labs. And the reason why is each platform will give me different outcomes based on what I need for my labs. So when I take a look at my labs, I look at the outcomes, I look at what's required, and then I find the appropriate technology that fits. And it may not always be the exact same platform each time. Making sure students are engaged in scientific method, making sure they're walking through properly. Making sure you're creating a learning environment where students can freely explore. And making sure you're always developing those analytical skills. So again, sometimes this may take several different platforms and it may take several different options but we do have those options available and it's very important to keep those in, in perspective when you're building out your labs. Taking a look at some of the research from Bell and Samantana. Computer simulations are computer generated dynamic models that present theoretical or simplified models of real world components, phenomena or processes. They can include animations, visualizations and interactive lab experiences. We want to make sure that they're interactive, that engage the students. We want to make sure that they are both theoretical, so the students do have the traditional lab experience where they're working on theoretical type evaluations. They're simplified, and they're simplified so that they're not going out working on things that they've never seen before. You want it to replicate as much of the physical lab space as possible. And we want to make sure that they have all of those visualizations that are required for students. So when we think about accessibility, what, ex what affects accessibility? Students' day-to-day -day lives. Are they able to sit down for a three-hour or four-hour lab? It's not always feasible, both financially and under time constraints. When you have an online lab, being able to replicate the lab experience and being able to have students start and stop at need is very important to keep in mind. I know during this time of crisis, I have a three-hour lab and to ask students to take three hours in a very high bandwidth situation where they're dealing with a lot of video and they may be sharing technology with other people in their home, 
is asking a lot of them. So being able to chunk and break down the lab into smaller bits makes it easier for students. So instead of having to sit down and obligate the typical three hours that they expected walking into class, they're able to break it down into smaller pieces. And that makes it a lot easier for the students because they're able to work at their own pace, they're able to go back, they're able to replicate that information and repeat it, and repeatability is very important. And I actually got better lab results by doing it that way. Digital literacy, making sure that students are literate. In today's society, we expect millennials to just understand everything. That's not always the case. Making sure you have clear set directions, making sure that students understand them, making sure they're accessible for all ability levels, and making sure the students have access to technology. In a lab setting, they walk into campus, and traditionally the lab material is right there for them. They have to buy little to none when it comes to lab equipment. Now we're asking students to do an online lab. Are they expected to buy certain technologies, certain pieces of software? Are they aware of this ahead of time? What happens if they don't have this material? How do they continue the lab? These are some of the things that we need to keep in mind when we talk about accessibility. So again, it's not just about accessibility as far as cognitive development or physical. It's also the financial aspect. Okay, we talk about accessibility in virtual STEM platforms. And when I say virtual, I'm kind of including all aspects of online labs. I'll break it out in a little bit for you. We wanna make sure that they follow certain technology requirements, making sure we were able to review vendors accessibility documentation, selecting the most accessible platforms meet your pedagogical requirements. Each platform at the minimum should have a VPAD or voluntary product accessibility template, making sure that your IT department is aware of this if not, making sure that they're able to find out what technologies are available and what access are available to students. Making sure you coordinate with campus accessibility members so that you do have those accommodation and planning for the accessibility gaps. What's lacking? What do we need to be aware of? In today's society, we should ideally be able to have VPADs for all the software that's out there, making sure that students have that accessibility not always the case. Do we necessarily take a technology out of circulation and say we can't use it because we don't have that ability? It really also depends on the students that you have in your class. Sometimes we can get away with it, not that it's the most legal aspect that we should be dealing with, but if we could use the technology and still work with the vendor to get them up to speed, you can kind of bridge that accessibility gap for students. Making sure that we understand disabilities. Students with hearing disabilities may be able to use audio and video materials if transcripts and closed captions are not provided. So making sure that it's done where students have the closed captions, making sure that they have the audio and the video, making sure it's transcribed. And I'll show you how to very easily do that for your students. Making sure that the students who are blind are unable to access images with digital versions of books unless text descriptions of these images are provided. Making sure that we are mindful of the text descriptions that we use not just the vendors are using, but us as faculty members. Some of them are very easy fixes. Some of them are built into our vernacular that we're not even aware of when we say things or that we put things in a lab. For example, click on this. If you're blind, what does this mean? You need to define it. Students with mobility impairments may be able, unable to use websites that require the use of a mouse. So making sure that you have that ability for all students. When we talk about abilities, there's a diversity of abilities, the auditory, the cognitive learning and neurological, the physical, the speech, and the visual. Making sure that we have captions, the text versions of audio content synchronized with the video, making sure that it's essential and ensuring your video is accessible to all who are deaf or hard of hearing, and making sure that it's just non-native English speakers. So that's important that they understand the content of the video, the spelling, the technical aspect, the jargon that we typically add into our everyday speech without even thinking of it, making sure that the interaction where students can watch a transcript so they can see the written word, making sure they hear the audio ver words, making sure they're able to see the video and linking it all together. And when I say linking it all together, I don't mean just a one fix situation, making sure a student can watch a video, understand it, go back, read the text, 
that's transcribed and or having closed captions and being able to sit down here in audio. Depending upon students' ability, some feel more comfortable with other platforms. Making sure we have captioning. We're making sure those captioning are either open or closed and or live, making sure that this material is readily available, whether it's available right then and there for a student or it's done after the fact. And I say that I don't mean the lab itself, I mean some of the videos that we're sharing out and I'll show you some of the differences. Accessibility in virtual STEM labs, making sure you have print, whether it's articles, tutorials, instructions, or you just support information, making sure your images, such as your photo drawings and charts, are readily available for students in multiple formats. Interactive objects, such as virtual lab equipment, the assignments, the exams, and making sure your videos, such as simulations and experimental recordings, are accessible for students. By making them accessible, it could be simply putting it up on a private YouTube channel or your learning management system, or putting it on a separate site. Your application of universal design to a science lab, making sure students with disabilities who face access to challenges in typical lab science at pre-college and post-secondary settings. Accessing those barriers may prevent students from gaining knowledge, demonstrating knowledge, or fully participating in lab activities. By switching to an online format, they're able to gain that knowledge because they have the audio, the video, and transcribed text, making sure they're able to demonstrate the knowledge. So it's about looking at how you assess it. And again, chunking that information to smaller pieces makes it easier and making sure they're fully able to participate in lab activities. I always think of one of my students who was quadriplegic and years ago was told that she couldn't take a lab course, even though it's required to graduate. And day one of class, she walked in and asked if she could remain in the class. How do you legally tell a student no? How do you morally or ethically tell a student no? Of course a student should be able to stay in a class and of course a student should be able to complete what's required for their degree. So being able to figure out a format that works for that student and all students so that they're able to work in a science class is very important to keep in mind. So when we talk about applying universal design to the labs, we need to first start talking about the differences between labs so virtual, and I'll just say virtual collectively, and virtual can be broken down a little bit more into virtual simulations versus remote labs. So we talk about a virtual lab, the investigations performed by the student with simulated or virtual equipment. And there are slight nuances between what's considered simulated, i.e. you're actually simulating what would have been in a lab and virtual where you're taking an actual lab and making it web-based. And it's performed by a student usually either asynchronously or synchronously. Remote lab, the investigation is performed with physical equipment that's operated as a distant. And that could be very simply used through a lab kit or a data set, which is manipulation has been done by a third party. And this often is indicative of analysis and visualization. And it could be that the instructor provides a video or a live audio feed, um, or it could just very easily be a live video where they're showing manipulation of the material, typically the physical material, and they're given the data set to the students and the students are able to then perform the analytical portion of the lab. We talk about virtual labs, you have commercially available virtual labs. There are costs to a student. They usually complete with lab reports under quizzes and they're usually ADA compliant. And while this is wonderful, when we talk about accessibility, again, keep in mind financial accessibility to students. With these commercially available virtual labs, it's what the third party vendor believes should the lab hold for their learning outcomes and their assessment. This may not necessarily fit with what you do in lab, but remember just because you bought into the platform doesn't mean that you can't write your own labs. That's typically what I do when I use any of the commercial vendors, I will write my own labs because it retains my own learning goals and outcomes and objectives for the course. Then we leave this out of the house, the OER virtual labs, which I prefer, they're free to students. So you have that accessibility. It often contains questions, data reports, notebook features, but it's not often ADA compliant. A lot of them are, and then I think it's very important to make sure that you're using ones that are ADA compliant. Again, going back to accessibility. So remote labs, how do you go about doing a remote lab? Very simple, again, it could be as simple as the instructor, the faculty member has the equipment, makes a video, 
walks the student through. It could be live, it could be recorded, and the students do analysis based on it, or we could turn to lab kits. When you're looking at lab kits, and it's not my preference, but when you're looking at lab kits, you can either use an off-the-shelf, which typically are higher cost, or you can customize, which makes it even higher cost. When looking at lab kits, I started to think about my students, and if I used a customized lab kit, it would have cost upwards of $100. That's not financially feasible for my students. If I used an off-the-shelf one, they're using maybe 10% of the material that's in the lab. Why should I have students pay that much money for something that they're not using all of that material? And I always worry, what are they doing with the extra 90%? Is it getting lost? Are they using it incorrectly? Are they trying to use all the material? Because now you're giving students all of this material and you're wondering, are they expecting to be using all of that lab equipment? So there are some pros and cons. Some of them include that they can be used outside the lab setting. Certainly that's a pro when you're dealing with students using any type of accessible material. It could be purchased as a lab kit and it could also be customized. But more importantly, the cons, it can be used outside the lab setting, which we would expect. So now how are they using it? Are the labs written correctly that students understand you have 100% of the lab equipment, but 90% of it you're not using? It can be purchased as a lab kit. Can students access it? Is it accessible financially? It could be customized to the needs of a lab course. Is it accessible financially? <laughs> can they afford the extra cost because you took out the 90% that you didn't need? It could be very costly, not just to the campus, but to the student. And again, these are not ADA compliant. On the flip side, you have OER virtual labs videos, animations, worksheets, they're free to students. The instructor can write directions and questions to accompany the activities. They can be used to augment content for discussions and writing assignments or as part of the lab, but sometimes they're not ADA compliant. We need to be mindful of this. And again, just to give you a graphic of what a data set lab would look like, where you have your animation here, you have your graph here, you have all the data, and then the students are expected to do an analytical write-up of that material. Again, not my preference. I tend to look more towards the simulations. They can be run rather quickly. They have random components and that random generator makes it more in line with what students would do when they are in the lab setting. They allow students to easily gather data from multiple trials and you're able to manipulate the variables. And by manipulating the variables, you get back to scientific method where students are learning the analytical portion of a lab. They're learning how to change things, they're learning how to collect the data, and they're learning how to conduct analysis of this. And just to give you a quick little blurb of the simulations. Okay, so this one happens to be from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, it's open heart surgery. And it does give you a little bit of a warning, which I'll give you a warning too. And it gives you all the information in here. And the reason why it's a simulation is, would we typically expect a student to walk into a lab to do open heart surgery? No, we don't. <laughs> and let me just switch over because I'm seeing right now, it's not showing that, that screen. Okay, so you do have different choices where you could look at the anatomy, you could look at the surgery, you can choose different types of doctors, you can choose the types remaining, and you can change all of these different parameters. And the reason why this is considered a simulation is again, you would not necessarily have a student doing open heart surgery. The reason why I say not necessarily, it could be used in some situations. And again, we also have another one for cardiology. I'm gonna show that for you as well. It doesn't wanna go, okay. The next simulation I'm gonna show you is food safety. And it allows a student to, again, listen in on the instructions for each of the modules. And by doing so, you're able to verbally hear what's going on. 
And I'll show you how that works as well. Just switch over. The reason why I think this is so important is what happens if a student didn't catch it the first time? It's written out. You're able to you're able to listen to it a second time. And I think that's vitally important for students to be able to replicate what it is that they hear and what it is that they see. One second, I just lost my spot. Okay. The next lab I wanna show you is a simulation of a Beats lab for physics. And what you'll notice on here is it does show what you would typically have in your lab um, equipment where you have all of your frequency generators, you have your power, it shows a quick display, it shows the differences in color between the different speakers, it explains what's going on. Let me just share it back out with you. Again, it gives you all of the information out here. And when you're able to begin it, what's nice is you're able to change all the different parameters. And by being able to change the parameters, you're able to go in very slow mode, you're able to do an action grid, you're able to take all of these materials and just simulate it. And by simulating it, students are able to actually do a screen grab. And when they grab a copy of the screen, they can put it very quickly and very easily into their analysis. They can explain what's going on. They can change up all the different variables. The next example I'd like to show you is the Doppler effect. And I know I'm showing a lot of physics ones, and I was like, I teach physics. <laughs> What I want you to notice is the bottom portion of the screen. You'll see that you have your red arrows, you have your blue arrows, and you have your green arrows. This is not just a simulation of the lab itself. This is a simulation of someone walking through, an instructor walking through the lab. Let me just switch over for you. Nicole, I apologize. We can't hear the sound. Oh, it sounds like I'm sorry. There is a little box in the pop-up window uh, in the bottom left corner. Uh, if you check that, the audio will come through the Zoom. Okay, well, I can explain and make it a little bit quicker for you anyway. <laughs> um, what the video was showing was that they were explaining the differences between the different arrows and explaining verbally that the lower arrow and the higher arrow were going to increase or decrease what it is that you were seeing. And I think that's vitally important if you're allowing a student to work in a simulation or virtual lab, explaining it out so that they are not just hearing, click this, do that. They're understanding the differences between up and down arrow. You're clearly delineating what's going on. And it's important for students who have different abilities, especially a low vision or a blind student, click this or increase the speed, how do you go about doing it? Okay, another quick example of simulation is taking a look at natural selection lab, again, where you have your graph, you have all of your different variables and being able to see a lot of those differences that are changing in real time. Having the ability for students to take something like an evolution lab, biology and motion, change those parameters at a very low cost and being able to, again, you always have in the corner, you have a speaker, you can turn it on, you can turn it off and you can see visually. So you have visual, you have auditory components. Again, another difference for virtual lab, 
So the virtual lab is a little bit different because with a virtual lab, you're looking at a virtual situation. Instead of a simulation where you're mimicking what's going on in a lab, a virtual lab, you're actually doing the lab itself, where you have the theory being shown, the procedure, it's actually being simulated in animation and then a video. And that's important, again, because you want students to understand what's going on by the theory, understand the lab of what's required, simulate it, and then show some type of animation so it's real information. This looks very similar to what you would normally have in a lab set up, and then a video explaining what's going on. Some of the more complex ones, some of the more complex virtual labs, obviously are not going to be free, but they give you the most up-to-date preview of what's going on in a typical lab setting. Some of the ones you might be more familiar with are Labster. And again, I'm not pushing anyone in particular, but Labster uses some of the highest standards for their product development. They have ADA policies for students who are colorblind and keyboard navigation. They have screen readers. They have character diversity. They have VPAT that is readily available. Another one is FET, which is Physics Education Technology. And they feel that shouldn't all students experience science. Students with disabilities can miss out on opportunities for authentic science and math experiences due to a lack of accessible STEM resources. They have an inclusive design approach. They have accessible interactive simulations and they have verbal descriptions and feedback that use sound and music to represent foundational science, mathematical relationships, and alternative navigation that moves beyond mouse or touch inputs. Again, very important because students get that holistic feel of what's going on with lab. And I'll just show you some quick screenshots. Some of them they have um, the Hooks Law demonstration. Again, it shows the different variables where students are able to change the parameters. Again, very important because you're trying to mimic as much as you can that you would find in a typical lab setting. By doing that, they have the ruler in there. You're able to check out the different springs and change up the different options. What I like about it is if you go through as a faculty member, not just showing how to use it or not just giving the link to students, you could actually walk through and explain what's going on in the lab. And what I'll typically do with my students is create a short video and when you do, you can actually access the transcript. So students have the visual, they have the audio, they can go back and watch it multiple times. And when they go back and watch it multiple times, they're able to replicate it. They can replicate it as many times as possible and it becomes something that is low cost and it helps out with their learning. And it gives them the ability to work with the lab and not be under time constraints that you typically have in a physical setting. Another example is a demonstration of refraction of light. Again, you have all the parameters that you would normally have in your typical class setting. You have all the physical equipment and it's important to make sure that they have the same equipment that you would have in class because the closer it is to mimic your class, the better the results are gonna be. But just make sure if you're doing a transcription. So this is actually a transcription from a video. And one of them is just making sure that things are accommodating. So what can we change to be more accessible and accommodating? Very simple, watching what you say. So if you went back and watched this video, for time's sake, I'm gonna hold off on it. You'll notice between the 0 0.10 second and 0 0.13 second, and yes, it is time stamped out for you. If you do make a video that's captioned, it will literally transcribe everything that you say. So if you look between the 10 second, 13 second mark, you'll see that it says red button. You can see I've got two beams coming out here. Two beams coming out of where? So if you have a student who has low vision or who is blind, out of here doesn't explain too much to them. You need to make sure that when you're transcribing your video or if you're using any online software that things are written out very clearly. You can't just say, I've got beams coming out of here. Beams coming out of where? Beams coming out of a laser pointer striking an interface along the normal line. I know it sounds like you're spelling things out, but it's literally what you need to be doing, spelling things out for students making sure your audio description and narrative 
describes what's going on. Just making sure you have a video. If it's transcribed properly, this one happens to be a clip from YouTube, it shows the source type, making sure that not only the source type, you can start and stop at certain points, it's time stamped out and it's captioned so that students can go back, watch the video, stop and start at any point and take a look what's going on with the text. Making sure that the transcription is there for them so that it's transcribed and students are able to read what's going on. And just a couple of different options you have out there. One of them happens to be CK20, I'm sorry, CK12. It's great because it does give you different options to take a look at um, Flexbooks, which are OER materials. I would not necessarily use it, and I'll show you why, for your lab material, only because it's a little bit shorter, but it is nice because it shows everything, it gives you your written portion, it gives you your diagrammatic portion, you're able to do challenge questions, you're able to do hints. So it's a nice option. Switch back. You also have free or low cost, which are my preference. Again, when I think accessibility for students, I think financial as, as well as the physical and the mental portion. You have MIT OpenCourseWare, which has tremendous amounts across the board STEM. You have Merlot, which tremendous amount across the board. You have FET, which has your physics, your bio, your chem, not as much earth science, but what's nice is you're able to use them. The only thing you need is Java, and you can write your own labs or use the labs that are incorporated. If you are using the Labs Incorporated, make sure that they continue on with those learning outcomes that you would typically have for your classes. You have Chem Collective, which is just for your chemistry courses. And then I broke it down for simulations, which again, will give you the closest to a lab situation that is simulated. It's not an actual lab itself. You have eScience, Labster, which I'll show you in a minute, your Proxy Labs, Lab Exchange, Hands-On Lab, and MorphoSource, which are predominantly your chemistry. And MorphoSource also gives you your anatomy. Or you could always go with the lab kits, which are the physical aspects, your e-science, your hands-on lab, and Carolina. So I just want to give you a quick demo of Labster. And again, with Labster, it's nice because you can download a summary. If this ever comes up. And it'll walk you through the simulation. And it'll tell you all the material that's in there and the related material. It will give you the different parameters of what's included in each one of the simulations for that specific discipline. <clears throat> and you can click on any of them. And when I just highlighted over it, it gave you learning outcomes. And for me, I think that's very important. Being able to download the quizzes, try the simulation, take a look at the different theory, walk through what's going on. These are important because it allows a student to be able to go through about as close to the lab as possible. You have very similar interaction with the FET. FET's another great one. Um, lab you do have to pay for a subscription, but FET is free. It gives you very similar. It doesn't give you learning outcomes though, but if you have your typical lab, you'd be able to mimic the exact same simulation. So at this point, I'm going to stop if anybody has any particular questions. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the mm -hmm. chat. So Tonka is asking, is the open heart surgery simulation accessible? And as a follow up, are these OERs? That is, yes, it is accessible. It is OER um, from the standpoint that it is free to use. At the back end of it, it's not 100% OER because somebody does have to finance it, but it's not the students and it's not the faculty. Okay, thank you. So Brian mm -hmm. is asking, what if the student were blind? Many of those context boxes and such, I'm sure would not be 
uh, available by a screen reader, readable by a screen reader or unable to use the mouse. Correct. Right now, Labster is probably the best option as far as making sure that they have the VPAT for ADA accessibility, but Labster is not free. That's the only downside. Um, VET is pretty good at it. It's probably the next closest for ADA compliance you're going to get, but most of them you can't use screen readers unless you do buy into the subscription. Okay, I, I do not see any more questions in the chat. So if anyone has any question, questions, please um, feel free to put in the chat or, or if you would rather get on mic. I'm just going to just remember right now. Uh, based on accessibility issues, one major concern is a lack of hands-on experience. Okay, how do you deal with this? Um, as far as hands-on experience for advanced equipment, well, being that I've been in research for years and I've been in education for years, I'm finding more and more, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, students are being taught the old school method where you're learning hands-on experience, and then they walk into a research situation, and they're basically brought down to red means stop, green means go, push a button. That's unfortunately, but the more technology we have, the less hands-on you're actually dealing with in, in most research situations or lab situations if students are going that route as far as their education. So do they necessarily need the physical equipment? Yes, it'd be great, but do they need it all the time? Not necessarily. For students who, and I teach students who are non-STEM majors, students who are not going into those fields, do we need to bombard them all the time with a physical lab? Sometimes you can replicate it just as well, if not better, being able to do it in a simulated situation. Lab kits are great if students do need that hands-on experience. I personally don't like lab kits, but that's just me. Um, and it's also a matter of knowing my student population. The lab kits are not gonna work well with them. Remote labs, again, when we left campus two months ago, did I think to bring all my lab equipment home? No, <laughs> I didn't think to, and I didn't need to. And the reason why is I knew I had access to very good online labs using virtual simulations. I prefer virtual simulations. I prefer making animations and, and videos of what's going on. I can show them with real actual equipment. I can demo how to use the virtual labs themselves, have students walk through, they're able to replicate it they're able to manipulate the same variables. And I think more it comes down to how the lab is written. No disrespect to a lot of those companies out there. They're writing adequate labs. Um, I prefer my labs. And when I write an online lab, I take my traditional physical lab, learning outcomes stay the same. The background theory stays the same. The only thing that really needs to change is the procedure. And if you have a well-written lab, it's the procedure that changes and you can do the same analysis and the same conclusion based on that. Does it replicate what's being done in the lab? You really need to, to take a look at certain software, certain ones, you know, I'll use one company for one lab, but a completely different one for another one based on how the labs are structured. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you generally work in collaboration between students using virtual simulation labs? I'll walk through the lab itself, like I would normally with a physical lab. I'll go through how to use the material. So in this case with software, I'll show them the theory behind it, make sure they work problem to understand why they're using it. Walk, walk them through how to use the virtual simulator lab, walk them through the lab itself and make sure it's in a video format, both synchronously and asynchronously. So I'll do it as a video and post it in our LMS. I'll also do it in class. So if students need to review it, they have it. If students need to review it because they weren't in class, they have it. They have both my version and they also have my version with students answering questions. Do you necessarily have to do both? Probably not. I just kind of overkill uh, with my students sometimes. So I put up those videos and then when they walk through it, our labs are typically synchronous, so we'll walk through it together. So I do make a, a short video of little snippets of the students doing the lab. That way that there are questions. Student could sit down and review the video and say, okay, I understand that this question was asked for this reason. And then I'll have them complete it. It does take a lot of bandwidth. I do have to give you a heads up on that. And knowing the students are, you know, 
not necessarily able to sit down for three hours at a clip with large amount of bandwidth. I am mindful of that. I'll chunk into smaller segments and say, okay, so we're going to do the first 45 minutes together and then I'll give you time to work on it on your own and then sit down and make up other times when I can sit down with students should they have questions. So my three hours becomes like eight hours over the course of a couple of days. Well, I think that's more because of the situation we're in. Any other questions? Uh, I do not see any other questions in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending.